Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Boston.com's Cocktail Club. I'm Jackson Cannon, and soon I'll be joined by Kevin Mabry, managing partner at J.M. Curley's and Bogey's Place. Tonight, we're building our favorite summer long drinks, catching up about the bar and restaurant community, and of course, sharing some tips the pros use to make great drinks at home. I'm going to go through everything you need for the session. And of course, all the while, we're taking your questions from the chat. Uh, if you saw the shopping list, you know we're making a gin gin mule. And for that one, you're going to need your favorite gin. I prefer a London Dry like Ford's or Bombay, Beef Eater or Tangeray for that one. Uh, you'll need to juice a lime. You're only going to need about a half ounce of juice for that one. I'd wait to juice the lime until um, after maybe you've made your garnishing. You'll need some simple syrup. Uh, and then about 10 mint leaves, and then maybe a sprig. Got the leaves kind of picked off here to shake in the drink, and then I've got the sprigs over here to make a nice garnish. Uh, we're going to top that drink with our favorite ginger beer. For the tequila highball, uh, you can use Blanco tequila or another favorite that you have. Lime juice for that, as well as a little bit of agave nectar. A uh, touch of hot sauce is uh, what we're going to spice things up with. And then you'll need some soda water and you want to garnish that with a slice of lime. So if you're working ahead, um, go ahead and make a lime wheel or something ahead of time. And then you can juice those limes to make the lime juice for both cocktails. Um, we just need kind of regular cube dice. I'm just using these little one by ones right here that we got from our little Target 15 ice cube ice tray. Uh, tall glasses are in order for these drinks, I think. we. I really like sipping these um, out of a big, long, tall piece of glass. If you don't have a Collins glass, um, yeah, a mule mug or a big double old fashioned or your favorite pint glass will certainly do. Um, other equipment, we're going to shake the ingredients before we put them in the glass to build these drinks. So you'll need a shaker, um, a strainer. I really think the tea strainer comes in handy uh, on the gin gin mule at least. And then um, something to measure with. I have these jiggers. These are what we use in the bar, two ounces over one, three quarters over a half with some little markers in between. Um, and uh, then of course, if you don't have those at home, you just need this fancy pants tablespoon. One size fits all, it's a half an ounce. So anytime we're calling for two ounces, it's four of these. Uh, lots of the recipes call for half an ounce. It's an easy measure, it's very accurate, um, but we don't use it in the bar because it's a tiny bit slower then when we get going, building multiple drinks with those. Uh, cutting board, plate, some tweezers to move stuff around, and you're pretty much good to go with that standard setup. All right, so Kevin Mabry is an award-winning bartender who has been at the helm and behind the stick of some of the most successful Boston bars and restaurants. J.M. Curley, Bogey's Place, Hajoko, Select Oyster Bar, Capo Restaurant and Summer Club, and Lincoln Tavern. That's not even all of them. He was voted best bartender in 2014 from Boston Magazine and Eater Boston as well, and was Time Out's top 100 in the nation at the same time as being one of Zagat's 30 under 30. Kevin has turned his focus to front of house operation and passing his knowledge on to the next generation of the Boston service industry. He's currently back at JM Curley's in Bogey's place as the managing partner, where he invites you to come in and see this team in action. He is a great bartender, a fine angler, and a good friend to support him directly. His Venmo is at Kevin Mabry. Please welcome Kevin. Good to see you, buddy. Hey Jackson, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Living the dream. I can hear the sweet jazz playing in the background of Bogey's. Oh, you know it. Pretty, we're live, we're pretty live awesome. Here, baby. Hey, before we get into the to the bars and restaurants, though, I heard that you went out hunting tuna for a couple of days, and I just got to know how to turn out for you. It went good. It was slow picking for the first day, but the second morning we went uh, four for four on some yellowfin tuna, some mahi on the way home, and uh, called it a day. It was a beautiful weather window, so we took the trip out there, and was very glad to do so with the hustle bustle of the summer months here in Boston. Did you and the crew keep all of that fine fish for yourself, or did you bring some back to the restaurant to yes. serve us? I uh, gave some to the staff here, gave some to friends and family along the way, and uh, the rest, I had a nice poke bowl this afternoon for lunch, and uh, never freeze it. So it's like make sure the first egg to as many people as possible. That's awesome. That's one of the great things about living uh, where we do, right? Yeah. Summertime, getting out there. Last time I went for tuna, we didn't get any. So, but tell some friends uh, who signed on who may not know the places. Tell us a little bit about uh, J.M. Curley's and how Bogey sits in uh, 
inside that restaurant? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I was part of the opening team here at JM Curly back in 2011. I moved here um, in Connecticut, uh, from Connecticut, uh, opened up with my now partner, Amy Martin and Bob Actina. Um, the first couple of years, we really the bottle, had a great team and carried that success over, you know, now going on 10 years. Um, I, I left after four years and wanted to pursue some of the opportunities I had along the way. This is consulting, opened up some great bars and was a part of some other stellar teams. And, um, you know, this past year, there's the story's long, long written, but uh, it was a tough year for sure. Uh, but I had the opportunity at the end of it to come back and be the managing partner uh, back here at Jan Billy and Bogey's place. Uh, we're located down in uh, downtown Boston, 21 Temple Place. Um, Jam Curly is a 100 seat American tavern, great little cocktail bar, 14 seats, concrete bar, American food that's you know, very much up in the kitchen right now. Longtime friend of mine who came over to help us kind of write the ship that I took over. And uh, we're, we're plugging right along. You know, summer down here has been a little tough, it's a little quieter. Not off yet. We're hoping that happens. It'll change in the fall. I will see what happens. But behind James Curley's, where I'm at right now, in this little corner of it, if you can't see, it's a little dark. It's a place, 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 steakhouse. It's only four tables, reservation only. It's got a little three seat bar top where I'm at right now. And uh, one server bartender, one in the cold room, um, kind of you know, wines and dines you. Is an extension of their home. It's not like the, uh, the trend, you know, have them kind of, you know, just like the style of service. I like them to kind of personalize, get to know everyone. Um, a lot of free theaters for out of right now, heading to a show tonight. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of back there. Well, well, how do, uh, how do people Julius get a reservation? At, oh. How do people get a reservation okay. back there at Pogies? How can people get a so, reservation? Uh, we're, available on open table. Uh, we're available on open table. Open table uh, has reservations always available for us. Uh, or just give us a shout, give us a phone call, or shoot me a message directly on my Instagram, cell phone number, whatever you want, smoke signals, whatever works for you, we'll make it happen. <laughs> I love that. Hey, people, you should know uh, in a world where a lot of great places that we like to go are closed on Mondays. J.M. Curley is rocking on Mondays. It's a great night to go in there. Um, hey, I'm getting a little thirsty. Should we build a, build a cocktail together? Let's do it, let's, my friend. Uh, yeah, let's take a peek at this Jin Jin Mule, right? So um, real quick, I wanted to get a couple of questions in that, uh, that um, were asked from the advanced login. Sam was asking if homemade simple syrup was as good as store-bought, and I think it's a little better, Sam, because you can control the process yourself. Um, Susan doesn't love gin and was wondering if she could do some substitutes. Yeah, of course you could use vodka or light rum in this cocktail, but Susan, if you don't love gin, this might be the cocktail that gets you, uh, gets you there. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to go kind of, uh, oh, and there was one more question about how to muddle the mint in this drink. So it's an interesting thing. Um, if we're making a julep, we really want to be real slow and press the, press the mint into the simple syrup to build kind of like uh, a, a drink that way. We're going to shake this. So when this, is, when this mint is tumbling around in there, being pulverized by those ice cubes, it's going to give up everything it's got to give. So I'm just going to start with a, a nice kind of 10, 10, 11 leaves that I plucked when I got started. And then I'm gonna add my simple syrup and my uh, lime juice that I juiced right before we got going right in um, to the shaker. I'm just doing a half ounce of each because I'm picking up um, this ginger beer that I'm gonna be using. I'm gonna pick up uh, just a little bit uh, more sugar. So I don't feel like I need as much um, as I might if I was topping with just soda. And then a couple ounces, uh, or actually I'm gonna use an ounce and a half of uh, Ford's gin here. Love Ford's gin, they do a great job with that. It's pretty cool, right? It's like, um, you know, I, I use beef eater in this cocktail, works really well. Audrey Saunders, who invented this drink, started with Bombay, another one that I yep. love. 
moved into Tangeray because that just got that punch you in the chest, Juniper, yep. Um, yep. that she likes so much. But uh, I find Ford just sort of lives in that space between Beef Eater and Plymouth so well that yep. if I just have to have one, it's a London Dry that stirs and shakes really well for me. So. Yeah, we're a big Plymouth house here as well. We use it predominantly in one of our house cocktails, the uh, 21 Temple Gin and Tonic. It's been on the menu since day one. And it just has right. that beautiful backbone to it. And uh, we, we love it for sure. But for this one, I'm going to oh, take rate 10. Oh, nice. Well, that, that's got all those as extra notes of citrus. So you're going to get yeah. a, you're gonna have a little bit little, different beast on your hands. And people pizzazz. who are using like, you know, it's like really cool new gins, like, Things like Bar Hill is a great gin out of Vermont that uses honey as a botanical. Like, um, I'm not saying that new gins and and other things don't work in this. I'm just saying what I like, which is something with a little bit more juniper than some of those have. Okay, I'm gonna put some ice in my highball. And then a little bit more right here into my tin. And then I'm going to load it up and let's go. For the first time I realized that Zoom is filtering out the sound. But it's, it's sort of like one way you can see if you're doing it right, because if you're not doing it regular enough, it won't filter it out. But <laughs> if you really get into rhythm, it will. Um, and then for this, I'm going to use the tea strainer, friends, both a Hawthorne and a tea strainer. That mint got all kind of like shattered up in there. And I don't really want, I want a little bouquet from the garnishment, but I don't want um, a whole bunch of mint uh, flecks and specks and stuff like that kind of, especially in the bars, we feel like that could get kind of into our teeth. That's not really what we're going for. Um, ginger beer that I have today is this Q ginger beer. I love this stuff. It's got spice. It's got natural sugar, um, whatever your favorite brand is. And then of course, if you're the kind of person who wants this drink spicy, after you try it, you're like, hey, I could use a little more kick in that. Um, some people do like to put a little muddle of some fresh ginger in there from time to time. Now, after yeah, I've got nice that, one. after I've got that loaded, I'm gonna take a couple of these sprigs that I pulled off of the mint. The mint in the garden getting pretty gnarly this time of year you can guys you can see kevin is fluffing it is what we say what what he's doing is not just uh scoring points there for style right it's accomplishing something he's he's brushing it he's in the back of his hand like that you can see as soon as you do that right it's like a sacrament full incense the oils just kind of release it's all in the air i go right down on the side of the glass You can garnish that with a long straw if you like. I'm just going to go au natural. I'm trying to use as little straws as possible these days. Cheers to you, buddy. Cheers to you, my friends. When you go in on that, the mint just kind of like brushes you. Ah, oh, God, you know? Yeah. I got a big old mint plant at home, so I got to put those up for my fiance. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's tasty. getting late in the summer. They're start, the, the mint in the gardens is getting a little spicier here because it's August. The, um, one of the questions that we took right here is asking how this is different from a south side. And that was a drink that we made uh, on here a while earlier. And important thing in the south side is it originated probably with a lemon or lemon lime split. So now it's a lemon or lime or lemon lime split. Um, it's not topped with any kind of soda. It's shaken and served as an up drink. And um, although the drink existed before Audrey created this one, it was not actually, this is not actually a riff on that from her creative process. So um, yeah, a lot of similarities. If you like a South Side and you're looking for something that sips a little longer in the season, uh, this is it for sure. Jackson, question for you. Do you like to add the ginger beer to top it off? Or do you like to maybe add, I know the technique of, having the liquid, straining the cocktail, adding the effervescent soda well, water right. or drink yeah. first. It can make more yeah, homogenous. Do you recommend that? Such a great question. You know, um, you can do it a couple of different ways. 
a little quick, after you put it in a little quick up and down of a straw can integrate the flavors. Um, one of the things I don't like about pouring it in first and then pouring over the top of it, which is a totally legitimate thing, is it is you actually lose a little more carbonation that way. Um, you know, this is a drink that's only getting about an ounce and a half, two ounces of that bubbles. And if you put that in below, you, you lose just a tiny bit more of it, even though it's all integrated. And that's what I don't like about actually pouring it into the shaker and straining it back over too. It's just Correct. sort of touches it a little bit too much for me. Sure, sure. Um, yep. And I, on this one, like when you do tip that glass back, you know, the, if you drink it out of a straw, you, you should do that dip move just a little bit sure. to get it married if you're drinking it over the top when you tilt the glass you're getting the top and the bottom coming up over the glass together so in this particular right. cocktail um i'm comfortable topping it off but it's a great thing to keep an eye on absolutely yeah thanks for answering that i'm really curious about that um all right those joining late we're going to drop that recipe back in the chat i promise you here momentarily All right. All right. So here's a here's a question for you, Kevin. How important uh, to you is the style of ice that you're using when you make drinks like this? Oh, it's a very important. I mean, from the shaking of it to what you ultimately pour it over, I think it's a very important quality of it. Because uh, you know, dilution is the biggest thing. You want to have enough of it, but you want too much of it. So the um, you know the cubes that we're making, the ones you show, like the nice one by one ice cubes that we have here. Uh, that you have is there as well. Um, they're very good at, you know, diluting something quickly with more uh, surface area contact, but they don't break up and they don't get over waterized, you know, over kind of dilute the cocktail. So very important from shaking it, but then also when you're pouring over it, you also don't want to over dilute it as well. So ice quality is, is paramount in a good drink. Um, obviously, this is very similar to uh, someone say like a Moscow mule, which would be a birch ice style of drink is you know would not be a meal without fresh ice correct yeah true story i'm big on the on the on the pouring over fresh ice for me and if you find yourself using something a little like chipped up a little bit smaller than the ice that we're using um i i sometimes will shake my drink before i add in some of that chipped ice just so i can do it really quickly and kind of get it back out of there over some fresh ice yep. and you know because even a cocktail made with ice that isn't as good as this ice it's still a cocktail so yeah still, okay. still can be pretty good as long as you pay attention to you know what's going on um one of the questions we have coming in is asking about sure. tips for making mocktails and you know you would think that if you were making this as a mocktail you have this ounce and a half of gin well I could just replace an ounce and a half worth of volume, adding it to the lemon and lime, right? That's, that's theoretically should be a very same drink. So by doing that, you would have like an ounce and a quarter each of the lime juice and the simple syrup, you would shake it and you would top it. But what that doesn't take into account is that alcohol helps all the melting going on when you're shaking that drink. So I actually like kind of bump it way up. That's my tip for converting like an existing alcohol recipe just by removing the alcohol and using the ingredients that are there. So I'd actually go two ounces of lime juice, two ounces of sugar. Um, Cause when you shake that, it's not gonna melt much and then top that with ginger beer. And that's a that's the thing to explore on a lot of different cocktails. Um, hey, uh, I wanna try uh, I wanna try something a little, this is spicy, but I'm thinking maybe it'd be fun to try something a little spicier. Do you wanna take us through Building a tequila highball for summer? I would love to. I would love to. Um, absolutely. So tequila is gained so much popularity in the past few years. And uh, we always get calls for tequila drinks. At every bar I've really worked at for the past couple of years, where we always have a spicy drink on the that current one we have in fairly Wet Mexican summer is tequila, passion fruit, uh, habanero, uh, habanero honey, essentially. Um, and then it has the tahini rim, you know, that spicy um, rim on there, too. It's been very popular for us. Um, but for at home today, something you know, I wanted to show you guys is something that's so simple, but really greater than the sum of its parts as far as a spicy tequila drink. Uh, I love wearing tequila 
uh, especially in shake and drink, is so herbaceous kind of person. I'll be bottled to that. It's something that I've really kind of, you know, I've been working with quite a lot. And frankly speaking, I love tequila. I've got a great appreciation for it more than ever now from a sipping perspective. Um, so we're going to mix up a little uh, tequila highball for you with a little bit of spice. And we'll show you exactly how to add that spice and different ways you can add that spice. Um, so we're going to start off um, with a little. We're using Don Julio. Um, two ounces of Don Julio is the call for this recipe. Did everybody have a chance to get their lime juice going? I'm sure they have, right? Yeah, we should have it by now. Counts for one ounce of lime juice. And then a half ounce, half ounce of agave nectar. Some people yeah, cut this. Yeah, this is one of those. Yeah, exactly, right? When you, yep. Is yours, yours isn't cut though, right? Correct, ours isn't cut. So it has a little more viscosity to it. It's a cocktail, more body. So even this highball that has, you know, a good amount of ingredients and it has, you know, shake and long term effervescence to it. It still has a good amount of texture and body to it, which is great. I also feel like the agave well, I, I, nectar, go ahead. Go on, no, please. So I also feel like the agave nectar compared to the, just a general simple syrup or a dem plays so much better with, you know, tequila drinks, especially. Sure, obviously, they go together. Obviously, they come from the same derivative of agave. And quite frankly, I just feel like honey is a good alternative if you need to use it in the pitch, um, as far as the flavor profile is concerned. But just it brings out that kind of herbaceousness uh, that uh, that tequila is, is, is so known for. Well, yeah, and so a lot of agave nectar is viscous and it's um, uh, sweet enough that, but it'll still pour. So we can right. keep it concentrated on the bar and sort of pour a half ounce. If right. you're working with something that's even is too thick for that to work, you might do the same thing we do when we have honey that's a little bit too hard to work with. We take the honey and we break it one to one with warm water. At that point, it can't sit out anymore. We have to refrigerate it. The same is true with the gave nectar, which will stay shelf stable. But if you break it with water, it just like breaks down that attribute of it. So. If you do that, you might make this recipe using an ounce of an agave nectar like that you've turned into a syrup. But for the most part, most of them right. pour well enough that we just keep them that way. Um, and so right. that's my, our suggestion for people in the home. Yep. And uh, we're going to add some Tabasco to this as well. Um, it comes Kevin, to Kevin, just for, to really, it, hey, uh, really quick from things. the Good. really quick from the chat. I mean, I know you're going to say great things about Tabasco, but when you yep. do, also tell us, um, are there other hot sauces that you might use? <laughs> uh, I, I love Texas peat. Um, that's one of my favorites. I feel it has enough heat to it, but it's also enough sweetness to it. Uh, it kind of rounds it out. Balance. It's already pre, it's already balanced. It's going to probably get its own right. Anything that is a good flavor profile for you in your own right will work in this drink because it's really going to come through all the way through. Some people like sriracha. For me in the cocktail, personally i've had many before especially bloody mary's uh but for something like this that's you know nice highball uh I, I don't recommend it but by all by any means it works for you you can definitely try it out um well but and from yeah and I'll, if i can at the bar we use I, tinctures we, oh yeah yeah i want to hear more about that in a second but really quickly at the and bar when he get, consistency oh yeah when he gets into tinctures friends um, he's going to be overcoming one of the basic things that you need to recognize in the sauce choice. Some of these sauces are seem are more oil based, and that what I don't like about sriracha and cocktails is just sort of how it hands there. Tabasco is vinegar based, so it just emulsifies really a lot easier and a lot better um, than some of the other more oily sauces do in a cocktail. So, but tell us about that tincture, bro. Yeah, I mean, the tincture is something we were doing like muddled drinks for a while and we realized that jalapeno to jalapeno, even when you muddle it or when you infuse it, really varies. So we were losing consistency in the end result. So by making a tincture, uh, we were able to essentially infuse a high proof spirit with habaneros, jalapenos, whatever it may be, pepper of choice, and be able to add a little bit of that 
gives us the same system to the other kind of, you know, you're playing the same game. You know, everyone could be different. So that takes a little bit of detail to do that, where a tincture is much more reliable. So I think we can start cooking this drink. What do you think? Let's do it. Yeah. Some ice. Ice down our eyeball. Shake it till you make it. There we go. Add the soda water. I'm gonna garnish that with the nice lime wheel. I gotta get one of those knives, Jackson. Yes, chef. Um, and this is a fun one if you are into it. I'm gonna top mine with soda. Um, but if you like palomas and you have a little grape oh, yeah. soda, that's, that's a uh, great call. That's a that's a winning variation here on this one. Absolutely. Yeah, I think Paloma was that gateway to tequila drink for me that really opened my eyes to uh, just the, the, how great it is in a mixed cocktail, especially an upgrade eyeball. All right. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. Oh, tasty. Yeah, I mean, what you get in there is tequila is very prevalent. Lime, obviously, you need that citrus quality to it. The little agave kind of rounds out a little bit, effervescent, bright. And it's like a nice three-dimensional cocktail. I, lo I love it. Well, I like how, like, it, you know, the Tabasco plays without being too hot. Yeah. And, like, you know, if you want, you can do four, six, eight, you can make it hot and the architecture of this drink will still stand strong. Um, but you can also make it so that it's, that tingle is almost kind of feels more fruity than it does hot, you know? Sure. Um, which is how mine came out. It's really a lot of fun. I realize how earthy tequila is too and how herbaceous it is. And has, a lot of them have really notes of that black pepper. So spice is like, just goes really well together with it. Well, and that's a, you know, uh, you know, one of the reasons, and there's a question coming in, like why Blanco in this recipe and that herbaceousness that you talk about that like fruit forwardness that like all the floral qualities coming in with, with that, like, that's what I think um, Blanco is so good at. You know, if you're going to be just sipping your tequila and you want a little bit more kind of barrel note or uh, structures that feel a little more wine-like in like an Añejo um, or a Reposado, that's great. But for, for these kinds of cocktails, for me, you just can't beat the um, the the assertiveness of those blancos, you know, like on on all the on all fronts. But especially the highland blancos that tend to be a bit fruitier as well. You know, mm -hmm. lowland in the valley, a little hotter, more irrigation. They tend to be more more earthy, savory. And then those highland tequilas, especially the blancos, I find to be a more fruitier, rounder. A lot of notes of pineapple in those. Um, I just think they're a touch better to be mixing with, in my opinion. Well, I was just thinking how well this drink would pair with that poke bowl you had earlier. Yeah, yep. It would be great with it. <laughs> Hi, hindsight's 2020 on that one. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. That's all the time we have for Cocktail Club this week. Make sure to follow us at Globe Events on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter for more information about upcoming Boston.com Cocktail Club events. And you can find me on all those platforms as well by searching for Canon Jacks. Thanks, everybody. Really, really appreciate it, Kevin. See you, bro. Cheers, my friend. Thank you so much.